Welcome to the Business with Beers podcast. This is the place where we help entrepreneurs expand their business, build their wealth, and generate passive income. I'm your host, Brian Beers, an entrepreneur who's on a mission to inspire growth from everyone around me. Remember that you need to take the actions others won't, and you can live the life that others don't. Please be sure to check out my weekly newsletter that now drops every Thursday. It includes one quote, one tweet, one podcast recommendation, plus some business and investing insight from me. It's short and it's sweet. My goal is to provide you with just a couple gold nuggets to help inspire your growth. Go to brianbeers.com to subscribe. Hello, everyone. I'm excited today to bring you Michael Horowitz. Michael is a Wharton and Harvard graduate who went from working on Wall Street to buying Wingstop franchises. Today, he's the CEO of Streetlight Capital and Buckeye Restaurants, a franchise investment company that focuses on entrepreneurship through acquisition in the franchise space. Welcome to the show, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me. Awesome. So, like, enlighten me on your franchise journey, right? So, you're at, you know, you're in grad school, you got this obviously path of, you know, Wall Street and, you know, why, like, why pursue franchising? What attracted you to the industry? So I started off not interested in the industry. I graduated business school in 2015, was really interested in entrepreneurship through acquisition throughout school, Um, left school to try to buy a business and spent about a year and a half looking at everything except franchises. I thought I wanted the flexibility to make all of the decisions and do kind of anything I want with no constraints. Uh, I didn't end up succeeding in that effort and didn't buy a business. So went back to work to start making money again but had seen other people having a lot of success in the franchise industry, particularly buying in top tier restaurant concepts. And so along with two buddies who were also looking to kind of get off Wall Street into something more entrepreneurial, we became shameless copycats and said, let's go find a brand that we think we can do this in. Um, And about an 18 month search on that front on the side of our jobs led us to Wingstop. Okay. And so I guess first, why why fast food? Like why that vertical versus fitness or auto or home service or anything else? Yeah. So the history of fast food has been 50 years of continued kind of growth and share of how people go out and eat. And it's been constant even through recessionary periods where people kind of trade down from more expensive food to less. So we love just kind of the long-term trends and the resiliency through cycles of the restaurant industry. And we also love that the restaurant industry is one of, if not the most mature and largest franchising segments. So we had a ton of different opportunities in different brands at large sale at large scale um, to get in and really build a meaningfully sized business. So we focused on brands that had over 500 locations and already a nationwide footprint. And there just aren't that many of those in other segments uh, of franchising. So then you go and you find Wingstop, all right? So then let's get into, so so why why Wingstop uh, then? So you, you look at all these different things. I'm sure you looked at Wendy's. I'm sure you looked at Domino's and, and pizza and like, yep. you know, there's a million Wings places too, right? So what was special about them? I think it really started with the unit economics story. Wingstops um, can put up pretty similar numbers to top tier burger franchises in terms of sales volumes and profitability but can be built for a fraction of the cost. And so Wingstop will talk about investment sizes in the $400,000 range to open a restaurant. And those yep. restaurants can make one hundred and fifty dollars to $200,000 a year. You don't see any type of cash on cash return like that in just about any other top tier restaurant segment. So that was super appealing as guys who wanted to go out and not just acquire restaurants, but also planned on yep. developing several of our own. Um, and then the other big factor for Wingstop was that it was a newer system. It was maybe 11 or 1200 units in 2018 when we first started with the brand. There were tons of franchisees who owned one, two, and three units. There were not yeah. a lot who owned more than that. And so we thought we could come in and be a relatively bigger fish in a small pond in that brand, building and buying at the same time over kind of our holding period. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very similar to my, you know, my story too. And even in, when we looked in Philly, like, you know, I started in 2010, right around the same time, right? And then, you know, we started growing in 2016. But even then, I think there's 75 stores. I remember counting like 60 owners. It's something. It was something like that. You know, we were the biggest and we had six. Um, and, that, you know, my, my dad had kind of built that, right? And so then, so we started picking them off. And today, like there is, you know, one, two, there's probably five owners now of those like six, 75 stores. Like there's been huge consolidation of all these ones and twos and You know, when I'm talking to people too about, you know, trying to find a brand, you can execute the strategy. Fragment and ownership is like critical. Um, 
because even right. you know i've looked into Wingstop since then you know because i heard your story and i'm like man that sounds good let me look so in philly you know there's one franchisee you know and uh, the, the indian last name and he yeah. owns all the stores in philly and then in the fdd you can see he owns like stores in maryland stores in texas i, I think he's probably got 100 locations you probably yeah, know who it is um, but like, there's no, there's zero chance of me like emailing him and say, Hey, can I buy like five stores for me? Right. That's not happening. Uh, and so then, then it's like, you have to build, right. And then your all strategies is all build. And if it's going to be a build, you know, is that then the best brand to go in? Um, so I guess it was, it similar for you or you just, you happen to be in a market that they didn't have that massive player in it. So you could go in and, and run this, run this play. Yeah, so we we entered in 2018. We bought seven restaurants in Columbus, Ohio, all owned by a single person. Okay. Uh, he had the remaining development territory and just wasn't going to build it out due to some personal circumstances. So it was a great opportunity, as you're pointing out, to come in and kind of control the market, both for the existing stores and all the development potential. Uh, I will say we really naively kind of underestimated what it means to buy single units across yeah. the country. Um, today, if I had the opportunity to buy one unit in Philadelphia while I'm running restaurants yeah, in Columbus, yeah. short of an opportunity to build 10 more on top of that, I wouldn't even consider it. Whereas in 2018, I thought, of course, we'll buy in Philly, yeah. Florida, we'll buy wherever <laughs> yeah. and realize quickly, like that's yeah. not a very scalable strategy. Yeah. So I, you know, it's the exact same in my model too. So, but so why is that? Why won't you like, what's the maximum you're going to go outside your existing footprint and why? Um, I would say it probably has to be at least five restaurants in a market for it yep. to make sense uh, for us to go in. And that's really because you want to be able to afford a an above store leader in that market who's going to supervise the restaurants for you, handle sort of corporate tasks in that market, work with the vendors locally, et cetera. And really less than five, it kind of financially doesn't make sense to support the salary of that individual. So that's kind of the, the yep. floor to me. What's the most, is that, so that's like, and mine's identical too. Five is our minimum. We're going to go into a market, you know, cause you, you know, we have similar unit economics. Let's, so you know, it's got 150 ish, yeah. let's say of, of cash flow a store, you know, and we're going to pay that guy over a hundred grand. Right. And then we got debt service and CapEx and all these other expenses on top of that. Um, in, in mine, the guy can probably go up to eight ish, nine ish is like the max they can handle. Uh, is it similar in, in Wingstop and your brand? I suspect that eight or nine is probably high for us. I think maybe six, seven is probably yeah. more typical. I think it depends a ton on how tight the geography is, how many of them they can visit in yep. a day. And then just what the labor market looks like. We've kind of given our district managers a smaller scope uh, to control right now, just because the turnover and the challenge of finding good people in restaurants is so difficult that if they're kind of constantly having a restaurant that's going through management changes, it's going to suck up a lot of their time. They can't really do that plus supervise six more stores. So we're trying to give them you yep. know, a little bit better balance. So how many stores do you have today? 20. Okay. And can you say what they're doing in total volume or average unit or? Uh, the run rate's about a million and a half on average, but a okay. pretty wide range on volumes. Yeah. So about 30 million total. Okay. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, it's, that's, there's a strong numbers too for, you know, like, a, like we said, to build one out 300, $400,000. Yeah. Um, and so then, so you start with these, these seven, these are clustered. How long had that guy been in the system for? Uh, I think he built his first in 2018, so about five years, or sorry, 2013, about five years. Okay, so relatively relatively new, right? Yeah. In, in comparison to some of these guys who've probably been in it for, for, for decades, I'd imagine. Uh, yeah, the brand started in the mid 90s, so it was brand new to Ohio when, when the original developer came into Columbus and, and built those stores. So part of our thesis also was, we looked at buying the stores, their volumes were lower than the national average, and we actually yeah. still lagged the national average by a little bit, not as much. But you got to remember when you're going into a franchise system, where did this brand start? How many stores do they have in those kind of core markets? And those are not going to be what your restaurants or your stores do in a brand new territory that you're first building out. But you got to make the bet that, hey, if this works in Dallas yep. and Los Angeles, it's going to work in Columbus over time as people become aware of the brand. Yep. Yeah, for sure. So how did, how did you find those? Uh, those actually were introduced to us through the brand. So part of our strategy was working with brokers and trying to source deals on our own. Part of our strategy at the same time was going to talk to the franchisors to make sure they were willing to let us into the system if we did find a deal. Mm. And using that as an opportunity to ask who's selling stores in your brand right now? What are territories that you'd like to see more development happen in that we could maybe make some proactive outreach to? And they happened to know that this person had had some change in personal circumstances and was thinking yep. about selling, so made an intro. 
And how much conversation did you have with them prior to to that? Like, did they did they get to know you pretty well, or was that so, like pretty early? We had a couple conversations. We met in person at a franchising convention with some of their development team. I don't believe we did our discovery day until we had this deal identified. Yep. Certainly not signed, but at least there was something meaningful on the bone to go do okay. that. And, you know, that's a full day meeting the whole team, visiting yeah. the restaurant, et cetera. Yeah, because a lot, you know, a lot of people want to execute the strategy, right? They want to buy existing profitable, you know, franchises, but it's really hard because franchisees want to sell to other franchisees, right? It's generally easier, it's quicker, they're already approved, right? And so a lot of times what I've what I've heard at least is that in, in the experience is if someone wants to sell, like the franchisor usually will will help try to get another franchisee, you know, in, in Cincinnati or Lexington or wherever, you know, to, to come in and, and take them over. And then it's kind of like if now if nobody wants to do it for whatever reason, positive or negative, then it's kind of like, all right, now we can start shopping it. So do you think that was similar in yours? Did like did other people look at this and just like geographically it didn't make sense or whatever the resources were? Yeah, I think it's a mix. There's certainly that element um, in a lot of franchisors and things change over time. I think a lot of them also do have an element, though, of they want to get some new blood into the system. So there may be yep. plenty of people who want to buy a territory, but they're not super interested in building another 10. And so the franchisor would rather see a new buyer come in who is willing to make that new store investment. And that was sort of our angle, not that there weren't other Wingstop franchisees who were willing to build out restaurants in Columbus, but we were very aggressively coming in and saying, our ambition isn't 10 or 20 or 50 units. We'd love to be a hundred unit franchisee and we'll, you know, invest as much capital as we can in this. And coming from Wall Street, you know, we were telling the story of we've got a lot of access to investor capital. Yep. So we're not going to be kind of the mom and pop who invest reinvest their cash flow. And hey, that is a friggin' amazing thing to be able to do. And you just compound like that for 10 years and you build a hell of a business. But like the franchisor likes to hear, hey, we could do 10 in a year if you know you give yep. us the opportunity. So did you did you sign a development agreement then when you bought the stores to also open how, how many locations? We did. Uh it was five initially and then when we finished that five, we picked up another, another five. five. Okay. And as part of the development agreement, you're you're paying them up front the franchise fee, right? Uh, we portion of it. part of the franchise fee up yep. front. It's pretty reasonable for Wingstop, so not a huge deal. I think the bigger deal is it's a meaningful um, relational commitment, not yep. just pay hey, whatever I gave you 50 grand to reserve this territory, but I've told you in exchange for exclusivity in this area that I'm going to build restaurants for you. And so if you end up not doing that, they can obviously cancel the DA, you lose your money, but the yep. bigger deal is you've now kind of- Yeah, broken the trust. So now, yeah, next- You didn't, you didn't yep. do. Yeah, that's what like, I think for a lot of people who don't understand like uh, area development agreements, right? It's an option. You you are buying an option to say, I want to, I want to, I'm going to put this money down and have the right to develop, you know, this territory or these, these locations It's not an obligation, right? So if you decide, Hey, I don't want to spend the, you know, $2 million to build out these five stores because whatever you can, but you're losing, you know, whatever you paid for that option. So in your case, whatever, $20,000 a store that you pay, so you paid them, you know, $100,000, whatever it is, that's what you're, you have up to lose if if you don't go through that, like you said, relationship wise, you know, now like they had these high hopes and now they're like, all right, this guy's like, doesn't follow through or anything he says, he doesn't have access to capital, he's not that good of an operator. And then, you know, they may not be bringing you deals uh, anymore, right? So, yep. yeah. Um, so you went through on all those, how long, so you bought, bought these seven, uh, when did you start developing the, the first new one? How we long after? Started work on the first new one probably seven months in, I think early 2019, and it opened okay. um just over a year after we completed our first acquisition. Okay. And what was that? What was that experience like? Like I'm sure there was some learning. Like it, what was the biggest challenge with that? Um I think the biggest challenge honestly was just kind of getting all of the pre-opening stuff ready. The the construction, Wingstop was very helpful and supportive. I worked with the same contractor who had built the previous Wingstops under the previous owner. So he was familiar with what needed to be done. And truly I was really saved by the district manager that had come okay. over the transaction, yeah. had opened restaurants before. And he was the one who kind of had the checklist in his head of, don't forget, we got to go to the bank and get cash for the register for the yeah, first yeah, time. All the little gotta stuff, have, yeah. You know, all this different stuff set up that I just wouldn't have necessarily thought of until we made a mistake. Yep. And do you typically try to go into existing, you know, places that already have all the ventilation or are you also building out ventilation for these things? 
we're almost always building out the hood system because it's specific to our fryer. Okay. Uh, you know, in a great scenario, maybe there's working HVAC that we can kind of take over, but we need a lot of it. You know, those kitchens get hot under the yeah. fryers. Um, so we're usually just stripping it down and doing everything new ourselves. Often we can get decent tenant improvement credits okay. from the landlords because another great aspect of the Wingstop model is we're not building freestanding units. We're not going into the best shopping center yeah, in town. We're going into like a B minus, B- right? Yeah, strip yeah. center. And we're probably the most prestigious tenant. <laughs> center. And to so the, we're bringing yeah, yeah. some value by, by putting our logo on the wall. Yeah, for sure. So how much does the location play into the success of like the actual address of, of the business? Like, is it critical? Like we, so we, we looked at Little Caesars years ago and Little Caesars, like we were told if you pick the wrong address, like even if you're the best operator in the world, like there's a high chance that you're not going to make it because there's not enough parking, because there's not enough, like the direction of traffic when people are, you know, leaving. Cause it's like, it's a dinner item, right? So if it's, if it's in the wrong direction, there's all these factors that we're kind of hard to know as an outsider in a location you look at, they got oh, this thing's great, but the rent's good, whatever demographics, but then it would fail because, because it just, there was these things that you just didn't really know about. Is that, is that similar or can you kind of go like anywhere? And as long as you execute good, you're, you'll be. Yeah. Okay. It's interesting. I would say it's the location is becoming less important for Wingstop because of how prominent we are um, with the Grub hub. Yeah, exactly. So you know, if you're a drive through a thousand percent, you got to be where the car easily swings off through the drive through lane back on their same route with minimal disruption. With us, we're sending a huge percentage of our orders out via delivery. And then a huge remainder of that portion are people who are placing call ahead or online pickup orders. And so they're finding us okay. online. Yep. Place order online. They're yep. just driving to our destination. They're not driving by seeing Wingstop and deciding let's pop in and have dinner. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And when we were looking at this was like 2017, 20, this was like way before any of that was, you know, like it is today. Um, yeah. Good. So then what's your, what's, what's the growth plan from here? How many, how many more can you build throughout Columbus? Is it like you're getting into new markets? Like what do you see as your next like big jump? Yeah. So we bought in two neighboring markets over the last couple of years, Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio. Yep. And so both of those came with additional development options as well. Um, so we expanded the development agreement on top of the five I mentioned in Columbus to have territory in Kentucky, Cincinnati, up towards Dayton, et cetera. So we've got all of that kind of development um, available to us. And that's sort of like the near okay. term. I'd still love to do additional acquisitions. Um, but unfortunately, the downside of picking a really hot, really strong brand is that other people <laughs> are hot on this trail as well. Yeah, and yeah. acquisitions are competitive. And so, um, you know, we'll see kind of where that ends up. Okay. So how many, how many do you have now, like the rights to, to develop or you've paid for uh, an additional 14 on top of the, 20. okay. In those, in those three or four markets. Okay. Yeah. Have you, have you thought about going into other food brands? Not really. Um, I think honestly, you know, the labor environment is insanely challenging and I know wing stop and we built a team that knows wing stop and can run wing stops. And so the leverage to me on continuing to expand in that brand versus having to learn a new system and train people in other processes and stuff like that is less interesting. I've thought about other franchise brands outside of restaurants, but truly, as I'm sure you can attest to, you know, the labor environment in a lot of these brands is really challenging. And it's yep. kind of top of mind for me with everything I look at is what are the type of people you have to recruit? How many of them are there? And, you know, what does that kind of management look like when you've got a, a business up and running? Yeah. Yeah. I, I you know, a lot of people ask me this, right? So why don't you have all these different brands, you know, these franchises, right? And I think a lot of it becomes like the franchise, it becomes like rinse and repeat, right? You can bring on a new location, you can grow in a new market and like you have some issues, but there's no like new problems. Like there's probably not anything that happens tomorrow that like hasn't happened before. And you already know how to fix it, what yeah. to do, how to, how to like make sure it doesn't happen again and reduce the likelihood, right? And like, but, but then if you get into all these other concepts, you have like all these different you know, brands, all these different like compensation plans, tax returns, leadership, macro things, marketing plans, like franchise or relationships. And it's like, you know, so then you're diluted and, and split into like four or five different directions versus like taking that energy. And it's like one thing that you can make, make pretty big. Uh, yeah. Right? yeah. And, and a big thing I've learned is that giving people, having a growing business that gives people the opportunity to advance um, into new roles is, is a huge way of attracting the, the most competitive, scarcest talent in the space. And so we certainly have people working with us today who 
it appeals to them that we have the ability to continue yep. growing and they could oversee multiple restaurants or step up into other leadership roles. Not that you couldn't transfer a great person from Wingstop into Taco Bell. I'm sure you could, yep. but it's going to be materially harder than saying, hey, we have an opportunity for you, great assistant manager, to jump over and take over as GM of a slower volume store 20 minutes away and you, as your first shot. And yep. we know you know Wingstop. We don't have to retrain you in a new brand. Yep. It's a lot easier. Yeah, we always say the bigger our world gets, the more opportunities that get created kind of within it, right, for somebody to grow. And it's the same same thing with yours. Um, but the interesting thing on the food side, though, is you do see a lot of a lot of the bigger operators do operate multiple brands. So it's probably part of the thing of once you get to a certain scale, then you can have this like really good CEO and it's not you. It's like your right hand man. Right. And like he's 100 percent all in you know, that then, I mean, that's where I'm at. Like once we can get to that point where it's yeah. like success is not dependent on me, it's dependent on the team we built. Then I think at least that's like, that's how I'm thinking about it. Um, yeah. And, totally and, food, and food seems to be, I don't know, food seems to be a little bit, maybe I'm not in the business, but it seems to be that you can like transfer from one to the other. And a lot of the, like, you know, the things apply um, versus, I mean, at least on auto side, it's like, you know, it's completely different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, so what, how do you go about creating culture? Like, what do you do to, to battle turnover? I guess, uh, how many employees do you have and like, let's start from there. Yeah. So we've got probably like 315 people getting paid every payroll cycle, something yep. in that order. You know, we're targeting to have 15 people on the roster at minimum per restaurant, you know, maybe more like 20 plus at a, a higher yep. volume location. Um, I wish I had a, a great answer. It's our biggest challenge and probably our biggest weakness. Um, and I think the biggest lesson for me has been, you can say and want to do all the right things and firmly believe them. And it still doesn't mean that they're going to happen. It takes an enormous amount of work. And so as an example, I've told our company, Hey, if a GM wants to come to me and say, Hey, I'd like to create a team member of the month. I'm going to organize it. I'm going to recognize someone. We're going to throw a little party, et cetera, et cetera. I've told everyone I am absolutely happy to kick in 50 bucks a month per restaurant for you guys to run one of these. Yep. You you take care of it, you run it, you you make the decisions. And you would think 20 out of 20 restaurants would take you up on that offer, free 50 bucks every month, recognize someone, have a party, not how it's worked. And so you really have to like hold people's hand and kind of explain to the managers why that's valuable and give them examples of people who are doing it and the success that it's bringing them and stuff like that. It doesn't just happen because you say, go for it. Um, and that's been hard for for me to kind of appreciate and um, figure out a way to, to overcome. Yep. Yeah, that that's key. And people got to want it. You know, they got to want to do it on their own. I think that's, that's the biggest challenge. What is turnover like? You have any idea? You track it? We track it. It is embarrassingly high um, at the, you know, entry level positions. There's an enormous amount of turnover yep. in those first couple weeks. And so another kind of culture piece that like we need to continue improving on is the onboarding process. You know, we talk over and over, you'll come into a restaurant, you'll see someone, it's their first day and they're back in there watching dishes. And you got to think, what kind of impression are you making on this person yep. if their first day on the job is being assigned to wash a bunch of dishes and not talk to anyone for a few hours? Like you've got to bring them in, you've got to get them excited about Wingstop, introduce them to people, give them some training, give them their uniform, kind of make it a more celebratory atmosphere. Um, so I kind of think about turnover in like these different yep. parts of the chain. You have the initial turnover of, did we get the person onboarded? Well, you have the mid kind of stage turnover of just, all right, has this person kind of gotten the training to do well at the job? Has this person been recognized for the things that they're doing well and given a path of here's what it could look like if you stay here. And then you have kind of the management turnover of, okay, now we're really holding you accountable to certain yep. metrics and is the turnover at that level because you're not happy with the way we're holding you accountable or because we're actually wanting you to turn over because we're not happy with the results that you're kind of putting forward. Yep. Yeah. We're, we're pretty, pretty similar. I mean, it's like the new mechanic that comes in or the newest person it generally the, 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 you know, last one ends the first one out or uh, whatever they're the most, they're, they, they quit. And so, yeah. you know, we're, we're going through that same thing of, of looking at onboarding. How do we get somebody involved with the culture? And yeah, that's what, that's what we feel. We're, we're at like a hundred percent. So if, I don't know if that makes you feel better or not, but yeah, we're definitely North of that. Unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Cause we have about, we have about 200 employees and yeah. we hire about 200 people a year. So it, it, uh, it's a challenge. It's talent for every business. I think if that's like, uh, I think if, if, but if someone's comfortable with that, that is the entire business, right? The entire business is just finding people who meet your core values and like, can follow instructions and are, are friendly. 
Yeah. If you can do that, like that's it. That's that's the entire business, no matter what you're in. Yeah. And, and you'll see it so clearly. Our, our kind of best performing restaurant over the longest tenure, um, four employees at that restaurant have been with the company since I bought the business. And they are the only four that have been with the company since I bought the business all at yeah. the same location. And it's no surprise that, you know, they continue to turn in the best results time in and time out. And when, when you built that culture in a restaurant, it can kind of become its own defense mechanism of a new person comes in who doesn't buy in, doesn't work as hard, doesn't become a team player. Yep. It doesn't take the corporate leadership to reject that person. The whole team of the restaurant will reject that person. Vice versa, you know, I was in a restaurant a couple of weeks ago and met a new team member who was on her phone for maybe a half hour out of the hour and a half I was there and yeah. the GM aside before leaving and said, look, the longer you let that go on, the other people who are doing all the work in this restaurant yep. are going to become resentful and they're going to become bad employees because they're going to see yep. that this person That's gets acceptable. Paid. Why shouldn't they? Yep. We're getting paid to watch YouTube. So, so when you go back to, I know you mentioned earlier that you go back to, to, to Harvard and you'll talk to, to some of the, the, you know, the students there, what are some of the biggest myths about franchising that you had, uh, you think that they believe that you, that you try to bust? Hmm. Good question. I wouldn't necessarily say that some of the myths are wrong. I just think that they, people don't necessarily appreciate the other side of it. So you think about, Hey, I don't want to buy a franchise because I want to make all the decisions about how this product or service works. And I want to set all my prices and I want to yep. feel free to, to tinker with all that stuff. And like, great, that sounds really good. But you're buying a franchise because there's a reason the product or service that franchise offers has done really well for a very long period of time. And if you pick the right franchise, if you figure out ways to make those processes, product services better, they should be receptive and listen to you over time. Yep. But it takes an enormous amount of stress off your back to come in and say, I don't have to figure out new chicken flavors. I don't have to figure out the optimal cook time, the best supplier. All of that is taken care of for me. I have to figure out how to communicate that brand value proposition to the community in Ohio. And it just makes your life a lot easier, particularly as a first time business owner who's like, oh shoot, I didn't know about these 10 payroll rules that we weren't following in the first week. I didn't know about these, you know, tax compliance things that we have to file. Like, let me go back and figure out how to make up for that. And all these other things that, my God, there's a lot you don't know as a first time business owner. And there's no way you're going to know. You're just going to do the best you can to figure it out and fix it along the way. Yep. Do you think that holds people back? Like that fear of, of all these things I don't know, and they're going to mess something up. Do you think that, think that's a fear for a lot of people? Certainly did for me. It's part of why I do entrepreneurship through acquisition instead of try to start a company from scratch. I knew I wasn't the kind of person who could make the thousand big decisions you have to make to get a company off the ground. I wanted those done and then to come in and figure out which of those decisions I could improve on or, um, you know, continue to advance. Okay, great. So is that what you think? So what was, do you think your biggest mistake is that you've made so far in all this? Hmm. Honestly, I think the biggest mistake has probably been not being a, not understanding this culture piece sooner. Um, I think I kind of came in expecting that people had more intrinsic motivation in a lot of these roles than they did, that they had sort of a greater understanding of how their careers could progress without me really spelling it out for them. So I got a lot of feedback in the first six months that, Mike, you're going a mile a minute in the level and the speed at which you're talking about stuff. Like these people are smiling, yeah. nodding because they don't yeah. want to do. They have no idea what you're talking about. And so learning to kind of take a step back be a lot slower, be a lot simpler in what you're trying to communicate, do it over and over again, and then follow up a million times to make sure, did you understand what I said? Do you have questions? Are you concerned about it? Et cetera, et cetera. It took me a while to kind of learn those lessons. Yeah, no, and I still struggle with that t today. And that's one of my things I really work on is keep it simple because I'm, you know, similar. It's like, you know, I can dive into all these reports and look at all these numbers and see all these graphs. And then it's just like this, you know, uh, giant spreadsheet means nothing to anybody else besides me. And so I think, I think that's really key is just boiling it down to the most simple level as, as possible. Like yeah. you said, but I think people need to hear something once at seven times before it sticks with them. It's like, well, it may be repetitive to you for them, you know, they, they got to hear it and you got to hear it too. Like when you're, when you're learning stuff. Yeah. And everyone learns things different ways. And so you might want to try saying it several different ways as well to find the one that clicks for that person, what is the way I might want to learn or 
uh, internalize something is not necessarily the way somebody else does. And so continuing to kind of figure out this person learns this way, this person learns that way. Everyone's different. Yep. That's awesome. So my, I guess my final question is around kind of the, the funding of it all. So you, you, so can you talk a little bit about how you funded this initial one and then the, that's what the, the future growth, what does that look like? You taking on debt, the equity partners? Yeah. So I started this venture actually with two of my best friends from business school. We wanted to run a business together, be entrepreneurs together. Um, so we found Wingstop together. We did this deal together and the three of us um, funded all of the equity ourselves with a bunch of debt. Um, my deal with them was since we were buying a relatively small business, I volunteered to move out to Ohio to run it under the condition that if they didn't also quit their jobs in two years and come join me, I got to buy their shares back. Okay. And what ended up happening, that two year mark was a month and a half into COVID. So pretty understandable that they didn't want to quit their jobs, yeah. come run restaurants when they were shut down. Um, but got super lucky in that Wingstop has been a great brand overall. COVID provided a huge tailwind behind that. So it enabled us to do a big refinancing in 2020 um, to get some new debt, help buy my partners out. The new restaurants we had developed out of existing cash flow were doing well. That generated some more cash flow. So kind of the flywheel for other acquisitions yep. and development, along with you know a meaningful amount of, of personally guaranteed loans. Yep. Uh, all SBA or did you go other routes? Actually not SBA. We initially got um, SBA offers, thought that's the way we would go. Yeah. And another benefit that we didn't understand at first about franchises and QSR in particular is that there are dedicated lending groups at a lot of banks for franchise and restaurant franchise in particular portfolios. Mm -hmm. And if you can find the right ones that fit your kind of size tier, they know the brand super well. They've got tons of loans to all sorts of different franchisees. So they know the performance, yeah. pretty willing to give you very competitive loans. Um, so we initially worked with uh, PNC Bank and now we work with Huntington Bank. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah Huntington Bank, I'm, I'm familiar with them. I know they do a lot of a lot of stuff in the franchise space yeah, not, and more than, more than just food. Um, Awesome. Cool. So any, any last like words of wisdom for anybody else kind of in your shoes, you know, looking to entrepreneurship through acquisition, maybe they're looking to get into a, a, a franchise system and, you know, follow your path. Any, any yeah. advice? So actually just today we released, um, AJ Wasserstein, a hugely successful search fund, uh, entrepreneur and investor, now a professor at the Yale business school. Um, myself and a couple other franchisees collaborated on a case that he just published 10 questions to consider when selecting a franchise brand. So that's on the Yale website and you can check that out. Um, kind of answers a lot of questions about how you evaluate a brand, decide which one's right for you. Um, so I'd encourage people to, to go there and read that. Awesome. Yeah. He, uh, he emailed, he emailed me at this morning. So yeah, I read <laughs> through it. It's awesome. Um, cool. I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. Very inspirational. I think, you know, shows like what's possible. You can build, you know, huge, huge cash flow and wealth, you know, through franchising and, uh, make a big business out of it, no matter what the industry is. So cool. So where can people connect if they want to learn more about you or, 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 or reach out? Yeah. I'm on Twitter at M a Horowitz, H O R O W I T Z or LinkedIn. Um, love to hear from people. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Great talking with you today. Thanks for having me. That's all we got for this episode with the Business with Beers podcast. One thing that would really help both us and other new potential listeners is to rate the show and leave a comment in iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen. Also make sure to link up with me on your preferred social media platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can find all my links at brianbeers.com. Please just share the podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy it. And until next time, remember to take the actions others won't to live the life that others don't.